Thank you very much indeed. I really appreciate um, uh, being asked to, here today and uh, it's a great honour and thank you Frederick and all of the organisers. Um, uh, I, um, I don't give talks anymore. I, I wander up and down stages uh, thinking about things that I find are interesting. And for those people who don't understand my accent, there'll be plenty on the screen for you to, um, uh, for you to enjoy. Uh, there's lots and lots of different levels at which um, I like to speak. Um, however, in repayment for AXA, um, I give uh, the gentleman who's now no longer here uh, via the media, uh, one of the answers he can find will be in um, David Raup's book, Bad Genes or Bad Luck, Stuart Kaufman's book, The Origin of Order. He needs to look at the MIT Technology Review 1970 paper by Haddon, and he can add to that a couple more, and I think he'll find that those will guide him in the direction that he's interested in. Uh, I rather like Brigitte in the background. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is something called neuroeversion. What I want to do is to take Raj's idea of the brain and the brain at work and provide a much larger frame, a, a much bigger picture uh, pointing towards the future of where we might go. Um, but again, I think one of the great problems in giving talks is that um, in general uh, there's a sort of tendency to want to focus on one's own individual experimentation. That I don't want to do today. What I want you to do is I want you to sit back, I want you to relax, I want you to enjoy what I'm saying to you today because I may be serious, I may not be serious, but there's lots of little things that you can look for as we go along. Um, you might be interested of where that is. However, I know that the modern world is um, a little bit more um, oriented to this particular version, and so I have no problem with people getting out cell phones, uh, getting out uh, iPads and Googling away. Please follow along because if you can, I should be most impressed. But this is not a presentation that I am giving. This is a test for you. I am not afraid of human beings anymore. I am close to death. It doesn't matter to me. I am a full tenured professor. Nothing very bad can happen to me. And my daughter is here and that's the worst thing that happens to me. I am looking today, I'm looking today into this audience and I'm looking into those eyes because I want to see what people recognize from what I'm doing. There will be a test at the end of this talk and I want to see somebody who can win that particular notion. Already there have been six um, uh, uh, areas. Um, okay, so what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to walk around. Um, uh, I do anyway. The structure of today's talk, I'm going to look back into the past. It's one of the aphorisms that I have that if we are going to look clearly into the future, we must look well into the past. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to have some small little vignettes. Don't worry, I've got some James Bond coming up. I want to look at what people thought 15, 20, 30 years ago would be the future in order to see those disparities. And I don't think I agree necessarily with our first speaker that they're so um, difficult to, um, to predict. Uh, I want to look at uh, neuroergonomics today. And in particular, I want to look at two areas. I want to compare and contrast the idea of automation with a new and emerging notion of autonomy. And I will define those and I will, um, I will uh, 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 bring those in terms of their expressions. And then finally, of course, I want to look at our prospects for the future. Uh, for those people who are, and I know um, because I'm a professor, and a professor is someone who has the bad manners to speak in somebody else's sleep, so I know you will want to know exactly where we are. So if you follow the little car, you will know how far we are into the presentation, and then you'll be able to adjust your effort accordingly, even though you're not hooked to anything. Okay, let's have a look at the past, the immediate past, the James Bond of yesterday. Can you turn the sound up? Please notice the time on the clock.
So spying clearly wasn't super efficient in 1969. That's the version that somebody expected the future to be. Not only did you have to bring your own suitcase with you, what he was doing is something called photostatting. I know that at least 50% of the audience won't know exactly what that was, and you don't know how greasy those pages were, but believe me, it took a long time to do. The interesting thing is that obviously you saw that that searched through about a million uh, options there. And if I take the latest um, uh, floating point operation and look at the speed uh, of the greatest supercomputer we sort of possess, there's one in China that does that, uh, it would be possible to search through that combination in approximately 10 picoseconds, or to put it more precisely for you, uh, the time it takes light to travel three millimeters. The time it takes light to travel three millimeters. I've heard light goes quite fast. The interesting thing is that it takes about a millionth of what we might call a perceptual moment, what William James in 1890 in, the, um, in his classic book um, uh, called uh, The Spacious Present, it would take about a millionth of that. It would not be perceivable as such by a human being. So in accord with what our colleague said a little bit earlier, we need to look at the rate of acceleration. If you like um, uh, the book by uh, Gleek on faster, is but what you find, if you look at our good friend um, Kurzweil, you also find accelerations. But I ask you to bear in mind that this is a positive exponential increase. And I ask you to bear in mind what happens or what characterization of what system is a positive exponential increase. And we will come back to those a little bit more. Let's go to the James Bond of today. today -ish. ergonomics mean anything to you? Man, machine. Now, you know you've made it as a discipline when you appear in a James Bond movie. That's, that is the threshold of scientific credibility. And this, of course, is now 2002. And I'm desperately hoping in the next version of the James Bond, we shall see neuroergonomics as, um, as the next stage. And what you can see is we see this sort of acceleration of the recognition of how important humans' relationship with technology is. Um, and this is a very interesting book by uh, Gilbert. I like this one because it's um, is sort of insightful, but it also has a, um, has a wonderful small little section. It says, eventually all scientists, I think, all psychologists, are, are constrained to write a sentence that says, human beings are unique because. So now let us look back. Let us look back to our origins, because I'm going to ask you to believe that our origins don't necessarily lie in what traditionally we think it does. So let's go back a little bit, shall we? Uh, let's explore our origins into, we need to go much further back in time. Let's go back in time. Who are human beings? Some have claimed human beings are upright gate. I'm not sure I like that. Um, if you want to go into an area that doesn't have a whole heck of a lot of um, necessary linkage with empiricism, paleoanthropology is the area for you. I wish I'd have gone back and chosen it last time. There's just not enough evidence around to go yes or no, so speculation is rife and you can see I'm a speculative guy. Was it the fact that you are a human being and that I am upright right now because I wanted to look over the savanna grasses? Was it beyond the wit of that particular order? organism to actually uh, look up in the trees and look over there? Maybe not. But if I were to look at your particular acetabular notch right now, I would see a remnant of that. As I look at your body and I look into your head and I look into your body, what I find is that a remnant of upright gait resides just here. I can look at it. I can look at the swirling spiral, in this case of the capsule, which tells me that you did rotate from, in this case, a four-legged animal. But are we upright gait? I would suggest not. I think that what upright gait does is it frees one very very important effector system. The effector system I've been using ever since we started here, which is the hand. I think the hand is an important prime effector system, and so I'm going to push that a little bit. But what else are we? Are we language? Um, but yet, language is surely just another effector system. It is just a series of vocalizations. It's a series of ways for me to communicate something to you instead of chiseling it stone and passing it on. It's a bandwidth system. But again, it's same. It's a muscular effector system. And what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the idea of tools. So let's look at tools. I claim that we are our tools, not that human beings created tools. This is the myth 
this and myths um, probably promulgated as much as anything else by a wonderful book by Kenneth Oakley in 1949, Man the Toolmaker, an absolute must read, a British Museum publication. But what Oakley said was, okay, let's look back as far as we can go and what do we find? We find tools. But I don't claim that we are human beings who then made tools. That is what I would call the standard notion. Rather, I claim something different. I claim you are human because of tools. Here's the standard notion. And what I've done here is I've just given you a nice um, uh, a Wiener based um, a cybernetic approach because this is quite typical. We've seen this uh, hopefully many, many times in our undergraduate notions. But the idea is that there is some a priori situation, human beings. They then create tools. Tools then are operate in a uh, feedback manner in order to change human beings somewhat, mostly changing, in this case, the social ecology, not necessarily the, um, not necessarily the underlying uh, capacity. But I think that that's a standard notion. But what as John Flack points out, and I think he's pointed out more effectively than anybody else, is as soon as you close the loop, you actually create an interesting problem. An interesting problem is then is origin and cause, cause and effect. So let's have a look a little bit more. Um, just a little sidebar here for a second. We're not the only animals that ostensibly use tools. Um, this is a, um, this is a uh, uh, quite a famous little picture here. Here's our friends working with ants. Um, this one over here, California sea otter. He's uh, using a little stone to open things up. And this one in the middle. Uh, unlike Oakley, I would claim, however, that we are the only animal that uses tools to make tools. Okay, so I wouldn't rule out the idea of tool use as a watershed. It's using tools to make tools. Uh, but let's look at that center one here. I'm going to go off piste for a second. Uh, usually I like a little uh, break while I'm talking away and um, uh, turn the sound up a little bit. Uh, everything I show you, everything you hear has a purpose. Even if you're not listening to what I'm saying, watch what I'm doing, okay? And of course, my last book was on cognitive deception, so uh, be careful of what I'm actually doing. Uh, some people will recognize that, I desperately hope. Uh, but we're off piste. Look at that. Doesn't that, particular, doesn't that particular stick look suspiciously straight to you? It did to me. I wondered where they're like, like this poor young lady. What we were doing were posing things in order for us to reflexively look back on the idea of tools. I think that looks suspiciously straight. That's just me. Uh, the earliest known tools that we have are stone tools. They are eoliths. Um, largely, if you go to the British Museum, for example, there's a proud exhibition that says uh, this is the oldest artifact in the uh, museum. It is an eolith. Uh, but here we have um, uh, some work uh, from science a few years ago showing in this case that we have a, uh, a variety of uh, uh, notions that could... Um, could stretch back to something like a million years old, uh, but of course we don't have any information on tools that are, are not uh, leaving a permanent record. And of course I should um, just point out this wonderful little chap here. Uh, the Victorians in England were very interested in that. It may be of interest to you to know, um, and hopefully you buy my book, um, it may be interested to know that uh, the English had such a great uh, jealousy of the French because the French had uh, Lascaux, they had some wonderful early parts of, um, of civilization as it were, and the English couldn't possibly stand that, and so they invented their own, basically. It was a hoax, but um, it was better to have a hoax than to be second to the French. I hope you realize that. As, as an ex-Englishman, I must put that forward. But this is a nice little chap called Flintknap Jack, and what he would do is, um, if, you were a, uh, if you were an anthropologist of that age, he would knock off you a million-year-old eolith, uh, if you asked him nicely. He used to sculpt it himself, and then he used to pickle it in brine and vinegar, and lo and behold, you had a million-year-old tool. At the time, it was very difficult to tell the difference. But we don't have any fossil record in this case of non-stone tools. And so even though we have a genetic record of where we go back to and the branching degree of the tree, which, of course, we only have a very faint notion of, only a faint notion of, we at least know that we go back a million years here. Um, I hope we're getting the notion. All right. So here's this what I call linear cyclicity notion. But now let's look at the other way around. And now as Flack rightly puts it, and I rather like um, Gould, of course, uh, times, uh, times arrow times, uh, uh, times cycle, what we have is now a circular relationship. And so in essence, I think as we begin to look inside the brain, what we begin to find on Penfield's homunculus, among others, is that what is happening is what's being created by tools are effector systems. We have 
hands we have there. We even have tongues down here. And so um, what I claim here is that we are self-symbiotic. That is, we uh, create ourselves. It makes it a very interesting species. We are self-symbiotic with our tools. So when we go back to the origins of neuroergonomics, the way in which the brain has worked its magic materially on the outside world, it has been symbiotic with the tools that have actually enabled us to do that. So you are not humans because you subsequently created tools after some spontaneously threshold that just came about. You are human beings and you are unusual because you are self-symbiotic. You work together. Interestingly enough, this particular notion, one of mine, uh, helps explain something. Um, again, hoping, hoping. All right. Um, so it means we are not a standard species. It means we don't sit on the same qualitative phylogenetic scale as all our colleagues and friends that I'm stomping on right here. It means indeed we are unusual. And this allows us actually to resolve something that has been a great human conundrum ever since uh, our good friend Darwin over here. Uh, what is the problem between the two? Are we indeed just another, um, uh, just another step on a uh, random scale, a non-teleological natural scale that human beings just come about? Or are we different in some ways? And our difference, the reason we are sat in here and the giraffes are not sat in here, is because of self-symbiosis. Uh, this is uh, all the great fear. I love this particular illustration. It's just wonderful um, because that reminds me of assistant professors. And as you get further and further towards this terrible thing called atheism, you become an associate professor. And finally, there's the full professor. I'm hoping to get my glasses and beard before much longer. But look how far down you go, the descent of the modernists there. And uh, doesn't that look like Sigmund Freud? It does a little, and we'll come to poor Sigmund a little bit later on. So tools are both a cause and effect of the imagination. They're both a cause and effect of the imagination. And so let's look into that imagination. They actually are the conduit by which we spread our consciousness in space and time. But what tools made were brains. What tools made were the things inside there. Now the first thing to note is brains are not cheap, okay? Brains are very, very expensive things to run. There must be some extraordinary advantage. Let's look at that a little bit more. Um, for example, uh, right now you are not really doing any great physical exercise, but it's costing you 30% of basic metabolic rate to run the brain. Now understand, until probably about 30,000 years ago, the currency that human beings operated on was not the euro and not the Brexit. They were calories. Calories were everything to you. Calories were the thing that drove your daily constraints to action. And 30%, 30%, 3 in 10 are spent on this brain. Oh, it's, it's, it's more than the heart, for example. Uh, so this has got to confer some enormous advantage, has it not? It must do. It must be enormous. It must actually be incredible. It must almost be a positive acceleration in terms of advantages. One of the more interesting things I like to ask um, is how long is this thing designed? You've got one of these, they're called a human body. How long are they designed to last? How long did nature design them to last? And the interesting thing is you can have a look according to allometric scaling. Uh, and allometry tells me it's 26 years. So the great thing I know now is that I'm statistically speaking to the dead. Okay, very few under 26 is in here. Most of you should be dead by now, okay? Well, that's all right, I don't worry about that. I'm not afraid of ghosts, okay? Uh, they scare me occasionally, but I'm not afraid of them. But look at that, why does it take 50% of our designed lifetime? Uh, yesterday, my daughter and I actually uh, were in the back of a bike going around Place des Toiles, and I would not let a 26-year-old go around Place des Toiles in the back of a bike. It's extraordinarily dangerous. But what age would you let a child out onto the streets of Paris? That's an ecology. Would you let them out at two years old to wander around Le Champs-Élysées? No, you wouldn't. Five years old? Probably not. Ten years old? Almost towards 50% of their lifetime, and they can't actually get into the ecology. What sort of thing is this? Very strange. My children are 29, 36, and they still ask me for money, okay? <laughs> they are still not independent, even though they're both statistically dead. I find that offensive as a rationalist, all right? 
But believe it or not, yeah, I'm quite surprised she's not working there. And, and of course, it depends upon the brain and it depends upon the circumference of the, of the skull in terms of birth. So here we are, this is human beings and this is our growth of size. And I hope you've seen this many times before, but what we see is a, um, uh, what we see is a, uh, 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 an increase, um, it's not necessarily a linear increase or a log linear increase, but what is nature creating here? Nature does not have purpose in that sense, but it is doing something. It is adjusting and searching for adjustments. And the interesting thing, I think, is that it creates a prospection machine. Now, I've finally managed to persuade our memory folks, I hope there's some memory folks in here, uh, but I meet with memory people all the time, and I've finally managed to persuade them that memory has nothing to do with the past. Memory has nothing to do with the past. Your history is only as useful as your survival in the future. And so memory that we think has been done such great work in cognitive psychology in recalling things that have gone on in this particular notion of prospection has nothing to do with the past. Memory is only purpose is to create a better way for you to encounter the dangers, what did our friend call them? The risks of the future. That is what memory is for. Nature creates a prescription machine. And where does it do it? The interesting thing it does it in is that it tends to do it here in the uh, prefrontal cortex. And what we see is this growth of, of what I've called in other places the theater of the absurd, the place in which we prospectively imagine our future. And this is what makes us what we are, and this is tools creating this part as well. So let's look at some of the present. I've got uh, some time ticking away here. The thing I want to do today now to tie this together with notions especially that Raja was most interested in, and things of course that I'm interested in, I want to look at some of the contemporary ecology that this particular um, complex has been thrown at. And I'm going to look in this case at, um, uh, at uh, the notions of automation and autonomy. I'm going to draw a concerted line between the two, although I believe that they are, turn Michelle up, turn him up, I want to hear him, they want to hear him. There we go, that's a little better, yeah, yeah. I know somebody, I know where this is resonating, yeah, I'm a psychologist, I look inside there, I know where it is in the brain. Um, what I want to do here then is I want to look at automation, which for example is extremely important to AXA, and even been mentioned today, we'll talk maybe about driverless cars. But automated systems, I think, are those systems which are designed to accomplish a specific set of largely deterministic steps that repeat in order to achieve an envisaged and limited set of predefined outcomes. I believe that's what dominates our ecology right now. That's what dominates our ecology right now, automation. And we are seeing the percolation of automation into new ecological niches. But I think we'll start to see this. And this is a very interesting sort of potential saltation. It is a change in that case in the externality of the tools which actually create us. Those systems are, which are generative, and sorry, this should be um, uh, autonomous. They learn, they evolve, and they permanently change their function and their capacities as a result of input from operational and contextual information. Necessarily, they become more indeterminate over time. As they begin to operate at the speed and the picosecond level that they operate, our ability to understand what they are doing will in fact begin necessarily to become more and more opaque. Uh, that's rather scary if you want, want to be around for a future. So we can look at this particular development as phases of control. We can move from, in this case, hybrid control over to the um, exclusively automated. I know I tend to speak around sort of things that I'm interested in. I do apologize uh, in that sense that I tend to be, um, I tend to be uh, sort of uh, uh, developing things as I go along. So I thought you might want to look at a very practical example. So let's look at a practical example. Uh, this is thanks to Trent Victor. 2017, Let it go. Volvo Cars will put 100 self-driving cars on the streets of Gothenburg in Sweden with real customers in the driver's seat. The unique Drive Me project is a part of Volvo Cars' journey towards a crash-free future. Volvo has now designed a complete system solution. Multiple radars, Cameras, a laser, 
and ultrasonic sensors monitor the complete 360 view of the surroundings. A network of computers processes the information, high-performance GPS and a cloud-based 3D digital map continuously updated with real-time changes in the traffic environment. If anything fails, there is a backup solution, just like in an aeroplane. This includes vital components such as computers, sensors, steering and brakes. On the road, the car is able to handle even the most complicated scenarios. The technology is so reliable that the driver can focus on something else without having to pay attention to the traffic. Just like good drivers, potentially critical situations are approached with sensible caution. And in an emergency, the car reacts faster than most humans. When autonomous driving is no longer available, due to exceptional weather situations, technical malfunction, or reaching the end of the route, the driver is prompted to take over again. If the driver doesn't take over in time, the car will bring itself to a safe stop. Now, one thing you've always got to appreciate about Swedish engineers is that they can predict exactly where that's going to happen and have already built the off-ramp, and that's very impressive, you, you have to say. I'm, I hand that to them. Um, that's uh, just a wonderful, a wonderful exhibition of uh, future prediction. Um, that's the standard notion. These are not autonomous systems, but they are automated systems to a high degree. And uh, this is not, um, this is not uh, uh, five years' time. This is uh, currently actually in operation. The earliest ones are now actually on road in Gothenburg. The uh, open release is uh, due to take place very shortly. Um, so where we can see the, um, uh, the general idea, but um, uh, I'm going to be a bit of a Luddite here. Captain Ludd didn't uh, necessarily like anything, but what did we used to do ourselves? So lots of things we used to do ourselves, were they not? Look at this chap on the left. He looks happy, doesn't he? A doorman. Um, I, I had a, a chance to hear somebody very interesting, um, a, a, a German scientist, a, a roboticist. I work in robots, uh, a robotics area, and uh, he was explaining how Germany had a, a growing uh, problem, in this case with an aging population, and they needed more healthcare people and um, uh, needed more healthcare capacity, and they were going to develop robots to do that. And the thing I, I sort of wonder about is, uh, do we have enough human beings not to do that? Um, so what are we doing when we take away something that somebody might actually enjoy? Well, let's have a look at some of the things we might take away that somebody should enjoy. Uh, one of the empirical questions I think you should ask yourself right now, before it actually becomes overtaken by events, is should we totally obviate any human activity? However bad it might look, uh, my friend Dr. Sawyer had somebody taking a hairball out of his shower this morning, and probably I'd want that to be automated, but maybe there are some people who like to do that. Um, this is a chap called uh, Mihai Chiksent Mihai, or Mike as people know him here. Uh, I, I found this so piquant because Mike in his book, The um, uh, Flow, The uh, Psychology of Optimal Experience, 1990, uh, talks about street sweepers. And here, what we're doing is somehow we're erecting either a piece of artwork or a or a recognition of what street sweepers used to do. Um, it turns out that those sort of artisans have been around for quite a long time. Um, Let's consider the aircraft pilot, largely because um, aviation tends to be at the front end of the wave of, of this, but uh, do we remember these people? A military pilot, um, Lindbergh, he actually landed somewhere close to here. These were heroes. These were humans who were heroes. And then they sort of moved on to the idea of, of the authority figure. And now we tend to think of them as, as drudges, just looking at, at their... Uh, are pilots becoming extinct? Are we going to curse these people to just look at systems that are ever more reliable? Is that what it means to attach, in this case, a, a neuroergonomic link between the observer? Are we actually going to create physiological measures that let us predict vigilance, where vigilance is unpleasant in the first place? Is that our goal for some research? Perhaps it is. Do we want to turn people into that? Uh, Sitting in the front, easy jet. 
And when you do that, what happens? This is from the Aviation Safety Reporting System. I love these particular ones, but this is not even an autonomous system. The first officer attempted to disconnect the autopilot and auto throttles using any acceptable means possible with no effect. Right. I have the picture of the man hitting it with a hammer, sort of like sticking, pulling wires out with no possible effect. And this is the plane I'm flying home onto the US. At approximately 300,000 3, feet, I mean, same level, we gain control of the aircraft, although not entirely sure how. Uh, okay, uh, that would seem to be a good idea to know how, wouldn't it? But if it was an autonomous system, you might not even be able to interfere. It's not just a question of not having a steering wheel, it's a question of that particular form of evolution, not wishing you to have any effect. And if it's a millionth of an instant, if it's a ten millionth of a human instant, what sort of effect do you actually think you're going to have? What do you think you're going to do with that? What sort of control do you believe that you could ever, ever exert over something like that? And so Raja, in his work on automation, um, this is Tom Sheridan's book, but this is a um, famous uh, 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 paper, uh, Parasurum and Sheridan and Wickens, 2000. Automation doesn't replace human performance, it changes human performance. And uh, if you want a little take home message from this element, look, if you build systems where people are rarely required to respond, then they will rarely respond when required to do so. And again, you can look at some of my uh, observations on that. And so we can look at this palimp set, this overlay of technology that's gone forward and forward, and we begin to look at the way in which apparently it appears as though each story of each technology is an individual one, and that history then unfolds in some sort of meaningful manner instead of looking at the overall trend. But here's the Indian uh, Telegraph Office, it used to be one of the busiest places for uh, electronic communication in the world. Um, how much is overtaken? Uh, here is the self-driving car. You've seen this before. Uh, here's myself and Dr. Sheridan uh, giving talks on self-driving cars. But you can see, um, and I'm not really concerned today with how we automate, but whether we should autonomize. Whether the road we are progressing down now, albeit very, very <sighs> laudably, from the general notion of the general narrative of human beings is where the direction we should be going. Should we be going there? Let's look at the end point of some of those. This is the Pilbara Mine, it's BHB's Pilbara Mine in Australia. Uh, it should actually introduce, this is uh, many more hours on the machine. You don't need lunch breaks, you don't need uh, crib times, you don't need shift changes. This is a completely automated system. You actually have, I believe, to get permission to go in there, and then they have to cer turn certain things off. I mean, this is mining the earth. In this case, no human beings required. And the chap is really quite happy, the other, the um, manager, because now we can keep the sort of general notion of overview somewhere in Western Australia. Uh, but of course, there's nobody on site. But are we short of people? When I asked that roboticist, okay, when he created his wonderful home care robot, I asked him what would do, what would the other people do? The people who now provide those home care. And his answer was a classic engineering answer. It's they'll do something else. Well, what else? Will they be a doorman? No, there's no doorman left. Will they elevator operator? No. They won't do that. Would they be a driver? Probably not. What are these eight billion souls going to be doing? Something else. If you remember the 1970s, and I do, it's hazy after the 60s, but I remember the 1970s, we were all promised a 25-hour week uh, of work and um, everything would be fine. We'd all have Friday off. It would be wonderful. We would sit in cafes and drink wine. And it didn't really happen, did it? So let's have a look at some of this penetration here. OK, this is a, um, a very large um, dairy farm in the north of Scotland. Uh, this is semi-automation. It's not automatic. You can see the uh, cows come in there. And what we see here is that um, uh, they're loading themselves in there. And now we've gone from semi-automation to pure automation. There's no human being involved here whatsoever. Uh, frankly, I don't want to go to the doctor and um, 
suffer this for an examination, but the cow doesn't seem to be too unhappy about it. There we go. And you can see here, uh, everything's nicely done. It's well engineered. Um, you can see it's very successful. Uh, there is no human intervention. At the end of the session there, uh, those come off and the animal then uh, moves, out to a, uh, moves out to a holding pen and moves back to where it is. This is a sequence then that's totally automated. Um, not, a, uh, not a projection, but a production now. So let's have a look at what the comments were on that. It said, um, cows either grazing in the field or housed in large shed decide for themselves when they want to be milked, some autonomy left, um, form an orderly queue outside, and some dairy parlors are now milking 24-7 without any human present. Yep, that's automation. Uh, let's have a look at that in a little bit there. Students, either grazing in the field or housed in large dorms, decide for themselves when they want to be educated. And they form an orderly queue outside, and some universities are now instructing 24-7 without any teacher present. Um, yeah, that's an interesting comparison, isn't it? Now, what else don't you want automated? Let's have a look. Some things we don't want to automate. Your family? I'm ambivalent on that one. I've already told you, yeah, a little bit of automated family. I can well imagine that that might have some benefits. I'll leave that one on the table. Uh, how about relationships? Uh, yes, okay, yeah, I can work with that as well. Yeah. Most people find their iPhone much more valuable than their spouse. Um, just ask them which one they want to lose. Maybe uh, leisure, um, that's me playing golf. No, I'm not sure I want to send out a golfing avatar uh, to Hawaii, where that is. Um, uh, graduate school? Maybe, maybe, yes. I think that's a possibility. As a professor, I don't want to see them too often. Are there things that we should never autonomize? I believe there are. However, my country, my adoptive country, certainly does. Is that a good thing to do? If we are, as AXA, as neuroergonomists, as ergonomists, trying to improve the quality of life, whose quality of life is this improving? Let us ask those hard questions now. So let's have a look at a vision for our future because we're now hard questions. Hope you got the little thing. It's not too far away. Don't worry, hang on a minute. It'll get there. Um, we talked about Freud. I'll bring Freud in here. This is now 1950s. Uh, this is the great forbidden planet. Here we have Walter Pigeon talking to Leslie Nielsen uh, about um, what happens when the brain turns itself inside out. So let's see. To understand our future, let's look at their future. Uh, there's a little Jane Austen thrown in here. You'll have to apologize Morbius. for that. Morbius. What? Something is approaching from the southwest. It is now quite close. Be wrong? No, never. There it comes. I feel sorry for you, young man. I feel sorry for your daughter, Morbius. refuse to face the truth. What truth? Morbius, that thing out there. It's you. You're insane. How else would you have landed here where Alta must see you torn to pieces? You still think she's immune? She's joined herself to me, body and soul. Yes, and whatever comes forever. Say it's a lie. Shout, let it hear you out there. Tell it you don't love this man. Not even if I could. <laughs> Stop it, Robbie! Don't let it in! Kill it, Robbie! And there, of course, is poor Robbie now having to obey one of Asimov's laws, uh, which is the proximal technology, the automation, uh, now um, pitted against um, what is now a combination, as I say, of Asimov and, of course, of Freud's um, uh, lesser part of humanity, which is now unleashed, in this case, by the technology. It's a very dark-ish, not the darkest, but it's, it's a very dark-ish narrative. I don't believe in heroes and villains anymore, but it is instructive to see how that was put together in the middle 1950s. Um, 
So what are we looking at now? Let's bring our level of analysis beyond the individual, as indeed our first speaker asked us to do. Let us take our notions up, not from individual human-machine interaction, but humans, machines, technology interaction. I hope somebody got that one. And what we see if we look at it from the outside, if we take a Lovelock view of Gaia, if we look out uh, into our planet, what we see is that neuroaversion is a, a thin veneer of the human orthotics and they glaze the surface of the earth. But they're a palimpsest, they're not simple to read, they're a palimpsest of previous cerebral aversions, which is why of course I put Beauvais on there. Beauvais is a classic in that particular sense. It is now sadly a thousand years old, almost, but at the time it was built, it was the most wonderful technology to exist. And of course, it has its place in our history. And they're each made materially manifest. And so if we begin to look at this case, at how we pass on our information to the world, most of us are constrained to do that, some sort of biological work. You have heard, I hope, of memes, which are the idea of notions of um, ideas that persist through time, ideas that themselves are subject to an ecological imperative to involve, an ecological imperative to fit and survive. But I think there's a level of what I like to call dreams or the materialized information. The world around me right now, this wonderful building, is an idea in its original conception, but in its materiality is something very different. It is a physical, concrete representation, in this case of a previous brain's conception of the world. And look at it, it's wonderful, congratulate that particular one. But of course there's not many that leave that particular footprint on the world. In fact, look, well over 99% of all species that have ever lived on this planet are dead. What makes you think you're going to beat the odds? Every student I have runs into me and says, oh, professor, I've got a significant result, P equals 0 0.01. And I turn around and go, well, we must be going that way then, mustn't we? As if you believe that particular threshold, you believe that threshold. Uh, let's look at some transitions for a second. Can you turn it up? So what a wonderful transition, what a wonderful vision that is. But I ask you here to now take that picosecond, to take that small instant of time and elaborate it out and realize those are exactly the same expression. Those are exactly the same expression. I've just juxtaposed them because they seem so different. So let's look at the way in which they look to seem different. Um, so let's take a good hard look at ourselves just to finish off for five minutes. Using up too much. Everybody knows it. What's neuroergonomics got to say about such things? We passed over in about 1984, 85. Not enough Earth, but we do the same thing again and again. Let's look at some of those. Oh, yeah, what happens if we create a better world and it was all for nothing? You know? These are characteristics of transitions from negative to positive feedback in some ways. I've harked back again to our good friend uh, Wiener. But we can see here, this is the expression of Moore's law, you've all seen. Uh, and we don't ask whether it's a good thing. Uh, just to reiterate human population growth, not to be Kurzweilian about it, but we can begin to see that nature of the change, the nature of the oscillation. So the question I have for you today, the question I want you to take away with you, the question that I think is very important is can we afford simply just to do our science in the face of these existential threats? Can we afford to do that? Is that possible? Or, more interestingly, is our science of neuroergonomics a potential answer to some of these existential threats? I believe it's possible that it is. So we are looking at systems on the edge, on the edge of stability, and we understand what happens when systems are on the edge of stability. Here is something called the wheelchair curve. It's the hockey stick curve, but extrapolated out a little bit. That's exactly what's happening to the Earth. 
you might be interested in that particular notion. But if we are getting to the edges where we have intrinsic feedback systems that now are destroying society, should we not begin to think about how, in terms of understanding of the brain, that we can now rewire that system so that it wires towards stability? Let me give you one simple example, one very simple example, partly because it comes originally from the French, the wonderful Michel de Montaigne. Montaigne had a strong influence on Jefferson. Jefferson was obviously very concerned in the way in which power was exercised, especially because he didn't too much like King George III. And Jefferson, among others, was interested to see how we can organize a society, how we can design a society that has a degree of stability. In this case, the American system is what we call checks and balances. It's a way in which the triumvirate, I don't necessarily agree it should be a triumvirate, but the triumvirate of the society should regulate itself where each element regulates the other. And if you look at something called signing statements, it's what the president does when he signs a bill. Comes from Congress, comes over his desk, he must sign it for it to become law. And more and more what we find now is that the feedback loop is actually being amended in this case by the president, in the person of the president, to say, no, I'm not going to follow that part. Well, thank you for sending me this bill, but I'm not going to do that bit either. And so it, in this case, it subverts the notion. And the worst thing, of course, is that when you get onto an automatic website and it says this is created for quality purposes, and you know that it's not, all right? You know it, I know it, but the feedback system has been perverted. And I was so interested to hear the first speaker talking about how AXA saw that. Very useful, potentially very valuable. So let's bring this to a conclusion then. I think what we're looking at is localized efforts at parochial optimization, which results sadly in global dissolution. We have much to say about that because there are such battles that happen for control, as it were, supremacy in the brain all the time. We have a template that can be used for these people. So can advances in neuroengineering be used for this template to regulate activity? Or is the inevitable end of neuroaversion, the turning out of the brain, eventually to create just an emergent species which overtakes us? Very difficult to say. We have to give up, as our colleague just said, the shibboleth of growth. Eternal growth was pointed out in response to Condorcet by our good friend um, Thomas Malthus, that it just couldn't continue. And we have to find stability on this planet, or we caught something called civicide. I hope you realize where that is and why that is and why that's a good example. This is your test before I go. Turn the sound up, please. There was something on there that was much bigger than the moonwalking bear or the passing gorilla will ever be. Uh, your job was to see what it was. If you can come to me with the answer, I will be very interested. It will be how I will rank order you in some ways. So I thank you very much. I thank you in the sense of what Raja did. Um, no need to applaud. His applause is, um, is superfluous, but I do thank you there. I am willing to entertain one or two questions, um, but I'm a strong believer. Oh, there we go. Yeah, everything collapses in a, a mess at the end. Uh, but um, I'm a strong believer in John Gay. Thank you very much indeed. I will talk to questions. Thank you. So, um, it's, it's incredibly interesting, very inspiring presentation. Um, but when we, when we look at one brain, um, 
can, can, so f for, from, for me, a brain is a place where there is a high density of intelligence, whether you want to call it that way. But actually, there are lots of brains in this room. Mm -hmm. We're all coupled. We're all resonating. And, 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 and you made us re resonate. We were all in sync, like the neurons in a brain. Mm -hmm. But um, so where do you see that connection? Because, for instance, this, all of the social media, et cetera, they have accelerated the brain-to-brain -brain communication. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, there is an, already an emergent organism. Uh, and and I, I wonder whether you, where you see this in the picture. Uh, no, I think, first of all, I think you're perfectly correct. Um, uh, so let me tell a little story before I try to not answer your important questions. So um, recently, you'll be pleased to know, I was asked to contribute a, um, a invited uh, a, a paper to uh, Human Factors. Um, and the nice thing about it was it was then turned down, which I thought was um, uh, one of the better things I did. The paper was called On Machine Epistemology. And I think in answer to your question, one of the things I find much more interesting in some ways is that I believe that I have some degree of epistemic access to your experience. I'm fairly sure I have very few epistemic accesses of the same level to what I've called autonomous, or in this case, highly automated systems. So that's the step I would like to take. The emergent brain property, very interesting question. Would we know what emergence looks like? One of the most interesting things is that as we begin to think about consciousness, um, it's always the conundrum that consciousness is, um, is not necessarily predictable from the next level down. And that is, I think, ubiquitously true, is that the emergent property of, in this case, multiple brains, isn't necessarily predictable from any one of the independent parts of the brain. So that's a, 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 an important step that we now have to take and to see whether the bandwidth of connection between us, which is rather slow. I told to you earlier about, remember the point I made about chipping out, um, in this case, little, um, uh, little stone uh, uh, messages that we can go backwards and forwards, extremely low bandwidth. I'm talking to you now, higher bandwidth, immediate connection one to the other in terms of experience, potentially a much higher bandwidth. Um, I'm going to take issue with you. I've been thinking about this particular question for a long time. I'm pretty sure that there's no intelligence in any human brain. Uh, I've been searching for them now for 60 years. I know that's going to sound strange. I think all intelligence resides in the environment. Now, the problem is that, remember I said memory is for the future? You remember how I was insisting on that? And you were thought, well, what a doofus this guy is. You've got to be joking. I, I certainly remember yesterday, and uh, I'm going to give something to my mother for her birthday. So what you did was you took an autobiographical memory, which is a trace that is individual to you, and then you said how important it is to you. But now what you've got to do is take a terrible step. It's a step of empathy. Throw away the fact that you're important. You're not. Sorry. Oops. Nature has no use for you as an individual, except sort of statistically speaking. How terrible it is to take that step. Most people can't. Most people cannot give that up. And why? Because it's who we are as individuals. Now, the question is, are we bound by that? Are human beings bound by this individual consciousness that resides somewhere inside of here, okay, and always going to be so? Possibly not, but I think we're in a race. Uh, D.H. Lawrence said we're in a race between education and disaster. I think we're in a race between, in this case, a sort of a level of directed evolution that we have hands on and our own evolution, which tends to be much more indirect. Uh, your point is extremely well taken, sir. Uh, you are perfectly correct. The next stage, my problem is I like to look after I'm going to be dead, but for example, for AXA, that's clearly interested in the next five years, the next decade and the rate of change, that's going to be a major focus of their notion. Um, whether it's mediated, whether it's going through technology, or whether we have some better ways of doing it is an interesting question. Lewis, looks like you've got one. Yeah. Sir. Thank you, Peter. That was a really enjoyable talk. So you've covered one aspect of the perspective, which is the abrogation of our responsibilities towards autonomous agents. There's also another perspective that we've been trying to push as well of shared control, mm -hmm. right? So I guess autonomous control is when I say to my PhD student to say, you know, you're in charge of your PhD project. Just give me a shout when there's a car crash, right? Mm -hmm. But what, what do you think standing in the way of a shared control system where we actually have 
um, a, a feedback loop where, where we're actually inviting a shared system? Sure. Um, I, I think we could engineer that circumstance. And uh, I really like your analogy because um, one of the differences between me and uh, you've got some of my students here in the room somewhere is I'm interested in breeding leaders. I don't want to have any control over what they do. I want them to do what they desire to do and my job is to keep the administration off them when they do something strange and, uh, and curious, which is always the interesting thing anyway. I don't direct people. So if you come to work in my lab, please feel free to come to work in my lab when it gets cold and windy and broom air or whatever it is in Paris and you're looking at the sleet coming down on the angles there. Just think of Florida, we call Florida 80 degrees, we call winter. Please don't come in the next week unless you want to help my wife with the hurricane. So I think we can, but remember the time constant. The time constant means that um, as we begin to make those accelerations, even though the floating point operation example that I gave to you was really a cheat because it was only flops, I was not doing actual calculations per se, but it becomes incommensurate with the two. And so um, unfortunately our engineers will always create it because they can, not because they should, right? If you work with computer scientists, the word they love is optimization, right? They search for that optimal solution. That's the holy grail. And you say to them, well, should it be optimal? Would you, would you like to make it suboptimal? It's, it's like you've offended their mother and father. It's a, sort of, it's a, a shibboleth that they have to live with. And do we constantly want to do that? And so I ask you, I ask you in this forum, because if I ask pure psychologists, um, they're interested in cognitive psychology. They're interested in how does the brain work? How is it wired? That's, that's fine. I have no problem with that. If I ask engineers, they, they will say, well, yeah, I'm going to see if I can build it. That looks, that looks fabulous. I want one of those. I will try and build one of those. We are the ones who mediate. And so we must be the ones who express purpose. And if you think purpose is going to be expressed, and again, please hark back to why I talked about checks and balances. If you think that purpose is going to be expressed by those who are, in this case, underwritten by the legal system, you are simply wrong. If not us, then who? And the answer is, I don't believe in Adam Smith's invisible hand. I don't believe in the power of the market in terms of absolute innovation. It might determine which is successful in an ecosystem, in this case, of a sort of viral capitalism, but it doesn't, it doesn't affect the actual genesis of the idea. I think it's the time constant that I see that's the problem. And, and, and again, we may be overtaken before that, okay? That was about 50 milliseconds. So again, we are now engineering our future, and there's a good possibility we're engineering our own, our own extinction. I ask you not to do that until I've gone. After I've gone, that's fine, not a problem. One more question, perhaps? So um, you talk uh, about how we are our tools or our tools are us. Um, I actually think that human beings are very important, or maybe that our tools are very important. It's unclear. Why keep the human there? I mean, if, if the humans are tools and tools are humans and, and the tools are overtaking us, what is the argument for keeping the human? in the long run? What a great question. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, I'll let you keep your PhD now. Well, good stuff. Well done. Um, did you notice the gentleman from AXA? Human-centeredness, our customers, constantly talking about that. There is no necessary reason why that should be so. Remember the 99.9%. .9 Remember the extinction. And the extinction seems to be to natural things that then somehow winked out of existence. There is no necessary reason why human beings survive. That's the great hubris of human beings. That's when they get up in the morning and not only do they have this autobiographical memory, not only do they believe themselves important, they believe themselves will always be important. Disillusion yourself from that particular narrative. Separate yourself from out of that immortal and terrible expression that you are of any great value or that nature sees you in that fashion, all right? Nature is not extending a purpose, but nature is actually moving along and moving along. And if it's gonna be a bit of metal that goes faster, 
Nature will say thank you and won't even think about it. It never can. Uh, if you want one great quotation on that, it's the quotation by uh, George Bernard Shaw, who, in expressing his great doubt about the theory of evolution, asked how, um, uh, and I don't mean to be perjurative here, it's a direct quotation and not mine, how it would be possible that Ponscombe would turn into the French Academy. That was his quotation. He's an Irishman. Please brain those people, not me. But his major point was, how would something so elegant and so wonderful in this case as a marvelous scientific society evolved from something below there. And what Shaw could not see and what Shaw could not do is to breach across those timescales of both space and time and to see those which we consider mighty changes because you're on this planet for 26 years and we see those as that part of the curve because that's the window of time we're constrained to look through. But broaden it out and you see just exactly how um, vacuous it could be. Sorry, what a terrible way to end. Sorry, let me think. No, human beings do survive. It's wonderful. We have a great time. We all meet on the beach. We all sing a little bit, in this case, of Bridget Bardot. The wine is perfect, created by robots, and we shall all be happy ever after. I'm sure that was the ending he wanted. Sorry about that. Not going to happen. <laughs>